Good morning, guys. Pastor Ryan here. First time ever coming to you from my house. Yes, many of you probably know why, because I sent out an email earlier this week saying something like this. Hey, over the last 10 months or so, we've all known someone who was tested positive for COVID-19. Now you know, unfortunately, two more. So if you're new, I'm so sorry that this is the way that I have to introduce myself to you from my house and in quarantine, but that is the world that we live in today. But thank God for technology, for being able to bring this message to you. Um, we're in a second part series called Moving Forward. And so good news is, is we are moving forward. I feel great. Um, I don't have a lot of crazy symptoms like uh, so many other folks are. Um, Pastor Ellis is really doing well too. Overall, we're, we're trying to do our best to just quarantine, hunker down. Our Thanksgiving plans got turned upside down though, <clears throat> and we're going to make the most of it. So anyway, so here's what I wanted to do today. I want to talk to you about the importance of really just ser serving. And, you know, because some of the marks of uh, a Christian is uh, spiritual maturity is do you give financially? Because that's a great test of your spiritual maturity. Do you give financially to what you believe in? The, the church of Jesus Christ, do you, are you a part of that mission? It's a partnership. You're not a customer, but you're a partner. And so that's one mark. That's what I talked about last week, looking at the book of Haggai and seeing that when a crazy world was being turned upside down, they started working on their own houses and their own thing. And then Haggai, the prophet speaks up and says, hey, don't forget about God's house. Consider your ways. And then they're going to respond. And we're going to see how they're going to respond today. And then secondly, the second mark is service. Are you willing to serve? Give your time. And most people today, they'd rather write a check than give their time and serve. And so that's what I want to talk about today is service. Next week, Scott from the president of I-68 Mission Organization is going to be talking about a wonderful witness that you can have in the world around you. And those three marks are the marks of moving forward in the Christian faith and journey. Those are the most important things, I think, that shows that we're in it. That financial commitment, that serving our time, giving our time, and then being a witness for Jesus Christ. And what Satan wants to do is to block all those things. He doesn't want you to move forward. He wants you to move back. So today I'm talking to you about being a, a, a servant, serving. Um, I remember when Leslie and I, uh, we first met, somebody had told me about this beautiful, wonderful girl that was uh, in the church. And uh, I was a youth pastor at the time, uh, working in a very large church. Uh, I was one youth pastor of many because it was a big, big church. And uh, they told me about this girl. And I remember it was some kind of outreach at, at the, uh, the event center that night. And somebody said, there she is. And I looked and I said, wow, there she is. And I was serving at the time in ministry. It was a singles event. And of course, you know, that's a great place to meet some people. And I saw her and I thought, man, she's amazing. And I remember I had long hair at the time. And then somebody pointed her out to me and said, there he is. And she was like, ooh, there he is. <laughs> like she wasn't into long hair. So as soon as I found out she wasn't into long hair, I'm like, I'm getting a, I'm getting a haircut, you know. So I got a haircut right away. Yeah, but one of the cool things about our story, Leslie and I, is that what really bonded us together is serving and, and just doing ministry together. And what's really cool about Pastor Joshua and Kaylee, I don't know if you're new and you don't know them. Joshua is an assistant pastor here, oversees our worship and uh, also all of our uh, community groups and next steps and all that. And Kaylee's on our communications team and works with our next generation ministry, kids and youth. They're so cool. You want to know why I think they're so cool? It's because they serve together. And when you're serving together, you're kind of like in it, in, the, in it together. There's something really special and significant about that. And it's not though, it's not just for like a husband and a wife or a dating relationship that makes it so special. It's actually when believers start serving, like it's special. It, it's powerful. And here's my concern right now with COVID-19 and the shutdown and everything that's going on in our culture is what if we just quit serving? Like what if churches just decided that they're, they're just going to log out and let go and 
just not participate anymore. I mean, it's easier to send a check than to show up or do something right now, right? So that's why I want to say moving forward, it's not just about financial commitment, although that's important. It's about significant service. And I do believe as a believer that it's absolutely possible for you to be saved, but yet not have a significant life of influence. And I think you need to need to strive towards that being significant. And here's what I don't mean about significant. I don't mean that you need to be, be handsome or pretty. I don't mean that you need to be rich or that you need to have, be super smart or that you need to be super uber spiritual. I just mean that this is that a life of significant service is obedience. It's about hearing God and then doing something about it. So let's jump into God's word together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everybody that is uh, here today uh, listening to your word and wanting to do something about it. I pray that we would hear your word from Haggai, from, from, from thousands of years ago, God, the work of God motivating and moving people to do something for your glory and for people's good. In Jesus' name, amen. So we pick up in the story in the book of Haggai, Haggai chapter 1, verses 12. Um, they are uh, back at it. They are the, the Jewish folks that are returning from exile to the promised land, but it doesn't look like a promised land. It looks more like a wasteland. The temple's destroyed, and they've been working on their homes for like more than a decade, they've been building housing communities and they still, they've been having some economic difficulties. And then Haggai shows up and says like, hey, just by the way, like you probably ought to be working on God's house and the temple of God other than just your house. And then these are good godly people, but in, in difficult, desperate times. And so what do they do? They, they, uh, they, they respond. W w watch this. It says in verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shetail and, and, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and with all the remnant of the people, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. So they heard and they responded. That's what good and godly people do, right? When they're wrong and they finally hear from God, they, they do right. This is, means that they, they heard what, what needed to be done and they do something. They obeyed. And then it goes on to say, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. There was a reverence. There was an awe. There was a mystery. There was like, okay, we're going to build this thing. We're going to get God's house and the place of worship up and going again. And so they go for it. In verse 13, then Haggai the messenger of the Lord spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And that a good message Haggai's wanting them to know, hey, God's with you guys. Even as you're uh, working on this thing, you're trying to get this uh, temple back together. God is with you. Verse 14, and the Lord uh, shows us what happens and how, how this happened. And it says, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. That's the governor. And then the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And then the spirit of the remnant of the people. So in other words, God's like getting their heart all fired up. You ever been there before? That, that, that is a contagious service is when God starts working in your heart. Oftentimes new believers get active and they start serving. So what if you're the guy in the, in the room right now that you really haven't been engaged in significant service because your heart's been unstirred? Does that mean God's not working in your life? No, God is trying to stir your heart, but, but, but pay attention. And so here's what happens with them is they, they just, their, their hearts are stirred. And then what happens, it says, and they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So they start going for it. On the 24th day of the month and the sixth month and the second year of Darius the king. And then again, uh, picking up in chapter two, in the seventh month of the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetail, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people, and say... So God's got a message and he's going to ask him some questions because they're getting to work on this temple, but it doesn't look anything like the temple that Solomon built, this huge temple. It's this kind of meager, weak temple. It's, there's just like a foundation, but they don't have like all the wealth and power that Solomon did. They just have 
some stuff to get to work. So their service doesn't seem significant. It seems insignificant. And God asks some kind of rhetorical questions. He, verse 3, who is left among you who saw this house in the former glory? That's one. Uh, how do you see it now? Is it nothing in your eyes? Let's back up. Look at verse 3 again. It says, who is left among you who saw this house in the former glory? What the reality was, there were some old guys in the room there that, that, that remember when Solomon's temple was built. It was big. It was beautiful. It was bad to the bone. And then what they're looking at now is just this weak little sauce temple that doesn't look very good. And they're probably embarrassed. They're probably ashamed. That, that there's nothing that they don't feel very good about this situation. And then the second question is, how do you see it now? Meaning they're probably looking at it. They're probably like, I don't, it doesn't look very good to me. It looks pretty terrible, pretty pathetic. I mean, I remember when we first started uh, uh, ministry at this church, I mean, people saw our campus and they said, are you joking me? This place is a rat hole. It's a dump. We bought it during the recession and when everything was torn up and uh, the, the land was just empty, the buildings were busted out and it was terrible. And here they are, they're standing there on their ground zero and it looks pretty rough. And the Lord says, how do you see it now? And the reason why he asked that question is because he knew in their hearts they were pretty embarrassed and ashamed of it. It wasn't anything special. There wasn't much going on in that temple, nothing like the days of Solomon. And then he asked another question, is it as nothing in your eyes? And the answer is, yeah, it's nothing to us. See, sometimes in, in, in the life of a believer, what we do is when we start serving, we... We start looking back at other times and think, man, that was a lot more special back then. Or, gee whiz, I don't have much to offer and to serve people. My, my work doesn't look anything like those other people's looks. And it feels pretty insignificant. And what God's doing is provoking the heart right there for them to kind of like do an inward inventory about their motives. And look what he does. So he knows where they're at. He knows the temple wasn't all that, but it, but he, he does this. Verse 4. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And then he said that three times, the three different groups, the governor, the high priest, and all the people, be strong. And then what does he say? He says, work. Work, for I'm with you declares the Lord of hosts. See, that's our message right there. When our work feels insignificant, God speaks up and he says this, go to work. I'm with you. So no matter how insignificant it may feel, folks, we got to get to work. When the country shuts down, the church still needs to open, stay open, keep moving forward, keep doing all that we can do to share and to show the love of Christ. COVID can shut things down, but nothing can shut down God's kingdom. Amen? Are you with me? Do you see what I'm saying? And so God says, go to work. Even though it doesn't look like a whole lot, just keep going to work because I'm with you. And then what does he say? He continues on and he says this, according to the covenant I made with you when you came up out of Egypt, Remember that? God had made a covenant and he said, I'm going to be with you. So then you get Moses taking the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land and seas are opening up. And I mean, God still wants to do that kind of stuff today. He's going to part a Red Sea perhaps in your life. When you think there is no way, God makes a way. He's got a covenant commitment with his people. There's always a remnant. There's always people that are willing to go for it. And that's what we're challenged to do. And then it says this, continuing on. He says, I made a covenant with you. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more. In a little while, I'll shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Sounds good. They're thinking, what? What are you going to do? And we got a sorry little temple here. There's nothing here. Nothing like Solomon's day. But then in verse 7, it says, I will shake the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in. And I'll fill this house with glory, says the Lord. The silver's mine, the gold's mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Everything belongs to God. They don't need to worry about how it's all going to come about. They just need to stay faithful to the future, a promise, and step forward in the present. 
And you and I need to live like that. We need to live, live with a future mindset that God's got pro a promise and a plan that far exceeds our day and our circumstances. And we got to trust in him, walk in it, keep moving forward no matter what. But you and I are called to do something, and that's W-O-R-K. That's work. Let's serve. S-E-R-V-E. -E. Man, am I talented. I'm spelling for you right now. So here's what I'm saying, is you and I are called to do something, to be a life of significance. Verse 9, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. That means that the future glory of this present little temple, he says, will be greater than the former. That means the one of Solomon. He says, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. I believe this is speaking to a couple of things. One is, is just the, 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 uh, the future millennial uh, temple that will actually physically, literally be on earth in that location, a temple like never seen before that God promises to bring. And so here's the reality. There's a future hope there. And that we need to serve God no matter what. But the truth of the matter is, is there's some roadblocks that you and I all face as believers. And so what I want to do today is talk to you about uh, three different major roadblocks that prevent us from serving God. And God's got you on a journey, and, and perhaps you're a little further on in your journey than some other people in serving God. You say, I've served God before, I've volunteered, I've done this, I've done that. Well, still, there's some roadblocks, I think, that have been set up in the last 10 months of our lives. And, and I think maybe that we've moved from feeling significant to insignificant. And I'm here today to call you to a greater level of service to God and his church. That's what we need. That's what this country needs. That's what you and I need. When, when I serve God, I, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling my best. Um, to do nothing is very, very dangerous. You've heard it said, idle hands are the what? The, the, the devil's workshop. You and I need to be active, ladies and gentlemen. So what are some roadblocks that keep believers from moving forward and serving the Lord? Uh, number one, I would say unprecedented circumstances, right? I mean, as soon as COVID-19 hit, like, I was like, what do we do? I mean, it freaked us out, but you know what? After a day or two of a pity party, not knowing what to do, freaking out, I had friends and pastors telling me they were doing major layoffs on all their staff, and, and it was like the whole, all the whole, the Christian culture like took a step back and said, basically, it's the end of the world, and we need to quit and uh, cut back from everything. And uh, you know what? We decided, no, we're not going to do that. We went online and started doing video for the very first time. We didn't have a clue as to what we were doing. We'd never gone online before, and we said, we better get with it. I called the elder team, and I said, we've never done this before, but we need to, we need to invest a lot of finances into going completely online, live streaming, and it's from here on out. And we did that through your faithful, generous giving and your service and our volunteers. They ponied up and figured it out. And it's been so good. good. And then as a result, our church has grown and expanded. Well, not may, maybe in the room, but online. And what, there'll be a day we'll get all through this. And we'll all be back together again. But unprecedented circumstances can be a major roadblock for so many people in, in, in their service to God. I think about the, the, the Jewish folks that were the returnees back to Jerusalem. They, they, they experienced a culture shock. The new normal wasn't so normal. The promised land looked like a wasteland. And they came back, instead of seeing their friends and their family, they saw a bunch of foreigners. And, and the familiar places and spaces were no longer familiar. Everything was messed up. Uh, the, the place of worship was closed. Sound familiar? But we as a church closed our doors for five months. And to be honest with you, I wish we didn't. I mean, we did need to learn, right? I mean, we didn't understand what this virus was. But man, we were closed for a very, very long time. Some of you guys might ask, well, yeah, that's right. I wish you would open up. Yeah, but I'll tell you this. We were able to, by God's grace and through your faithful giving, we were able to do $200,000 worth of work on our campus from infrastructure to parking lots to kids space to adult space to technology. Huge things we were able to do through your generosity through the campus development funds. And that was a good thing. And, and it took that time to do that. So God used it. 
But most of the time for many churches that are closing their doors and many believers are closing the doors on their services and not, as, not, not being a part, not playing a contributing part, is, is they're afraid and they're, these unprecedented circumstances have blocked them out. And we can't do that. See, there, there was this culture shock for these guys that we looked in in the book of Haggai. Their place of worship was closed and their economy, like our economy, this is kind of a mess. I mean, you went from Babylon being the leading world empire to now Persia is now in charge. And thankfully, King Darius says, you can go back, guys. I'm not going to hold you captive anymore. Go home. Start working on your homes and get moving. But I think unprecedented circumstances can really knock us out of the race of running for the Lord. And, and I think we could use it as an excuse too, though, because see... In the book of Haggai, there is no excuse for that. See, Haggai shows up on the scene and says, Hey, I, I know you're going through a hard time, but when I see what you're doing here is you focused all your energy on building your houses. You got them paneled. And that's really nice, but what about the house of the Lord? So that's my question for us as believers in 2020. Is like, hey, like I know COVID-19 knocked us out. I'm quarantined. But it can't take me out. Can't take me out of the race. I still got to run. And so do you. We've got a, a, a higher allegiance to anything and anyone. And that is the name of Jesus. And his kingdom is unshakable. And so unprecedented circumstances, I get it. They can sure uh, be a roadblock. But that roadblock needs to get busted down. Secondly, I think the, uh, a, a roadblock is unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations can really uh, be a roadblock that prevent us uh, from accomplishing God's plans and purposes for service and ministry. I think about for those, uh, the Jewish folks that showed up, that what they did is they kind of had these unrealistic expectations. They looked at the Solomon's temple and they started comparing themselves back and thinking, you know what, our, our place doesn't look anything like it should. You know, maybe we ought to just quit because we'll never get it up to where it, it used to be. It's kind of like this comparison game. Eh? What fuels unrealistic expectation is when you and I start to compare ourselves to others or somebody starts to compare us and then we find out. I remember uh, uh, years ago, we were sitting on the couch and I've just turned 40 and my wife, we're watching Tom Brady on TV and he's, you know, he's like a rock star football player. Awesome, you know, great dude. Super healthy, buff, fit dude. She turns to me and says, you know what? I mean, he's 40. What if, what if you did some of the things he did? And, you know, why don't you push yourself like that? <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, like, that's Tom Brady. Like, and he's a multi-millionaire, like multi-millions and millions of dollars, like going into his body and his health. Like, I, I can't meet those expectations. I wanted to say to her, or this is what I said. I said, well, why don't you look like, uh, you know, his, his wife? She's a supermodel. No, of course I didn't say that. If I would have said that, uh, no, it would not be good. But so what happens so many times is we have unrealistic expectations and it can really emotionally take us out of the game. When we have unrealistic expectations in our, our marriage, that the spouse needs to complete all our needs. Like Toby Maguire says, you complete me. No, you don't. You don't complete anybody. You're complete in Jesus Christ. You complement one another. You're a blessing for one another. But when we have unrealistic expectations that this person's going to fill the greatest need in my life or that I'm going to do this for that, we are discouraged. Or we do that in our work or in our income. If I just got this or I just did this, we have unrealistic expectations and that roadblock can really take us out. And from serving God. Maybe uh, I think of just comparison when you look at other people that are serving in the church and they're doing a great job and they're happy and they're cheery all the time and they have all these super gifts, but you don't. Then you, have an un, you can have this unrealistic expectation. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have these gifts and if you do that, then you can make a life of significance. 
And that's just unrealistic expectations. That's a roadblock, brother. That's a roadblock, sister, that blocks you from serving God in a life of significance. Don't, don't compare yourself. Don't have that real, those expectations. God wants you to just start right where you're at with him. And so then there's this idolizing the past. This is exactly what they were doing. They were looking back to the past days of glory when the temple of Solomon was so awesome. And then they got a weak little measly temple that's not going so good. They missed it. They were hoping for something greater. And I think sometimes as a Christian, we idolize seasons and past in time of our life and think, if my life was just like that, or I remember when I was at this other church, or I was at this experience in my season of faith in my life, and then if I could just have that back then here and now, then I'd be happy. And no, you wouldn't. Or sometimes as Christians, we think it would be so cool to live back in the days of Jesus. And if I was a disciple then, then I'd really be on fire for my faith. Well, guess what? You're a disciple in 2020. (laughs) And God didn't mess up. He planned on you being here. And you can't idolize the past all you want. But when you do so, you're setting up a roadblock for significance for today and tomorrow. And so, unrealistic expectations can really blow you out of the water. And then perhaps you just want everything to be perfect too, you know. And that's what really messes up unrealistic expectations is that you just want everything to be good. And you think, if I just get everything right in my life and everything's just wonderful and all the numbers match and all the cases go down and this goes half, then I'll apply myself to serving God in the church. Well, friends, you can do stuff right now and and never socially be present. You could, you could contact the staff and say, hey, I want to support the administrative needs or the online needs or whatever. But let me tell you something, guys. Like Haggai, when he showed up, let me be Haggai, that guy, to just say, like, look, like in this pandemic, don't get all focused up on yourself. Focus on others. Focus on God. Don't let that roadblock knock you out of the race that God wants you to run. Third roadblock that really can take us out is unhealthy fears unhealthy fears. What is an unhealthy fear? An unhealthy fear is something that paralyzes you from doing what you're supposed to do. So l- let, me, let, me, let me illustrate that from, from, from my own life in, in an example. And then what I'll do is I'll come back and explain what it means, you know, contextually in, in the book of Haggai. So as a, years ago, I served as a river rafting guide. And I remember I was, in, I was in charge on the Arkansas River Valley in Buena Vista, Colorado, and uh, class three, class four, class five white water. I'm taking customers down every single day on this wild stretch of white water. Tons of fun. But there's this one rapid that's got me freaked out, and it's Seidel's suck hole. Look it up. And uh, unfortunately, every single summer, because of the sheer volume of people that go down on this river, that somebody would die every year. There'd be a a number of people that would die on this river. And as a young 20-something-year-old rafting guide, I remember thinking, I'm terrified of this. What if I lost somebody? What if it was my fault as a guide that I go down Seidel's suck hole, and that was the rapid that took somebody, sucked them underwater, and they drowned to death? And that, 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 that fear started repeating itself in my mind and in my dreams. And I remember uh, I had run that river several times before. Uh, in totality of all my experience, I logged 3,000 river miles on that river. So I, I had it pretty dialed at that point in time in my career as a river rafting guide. But that freaked me out. And you know what happened was fear paralyzed me. And I remember going down that rapid. And one time I went down it with my customers. We flipped over and everybody popped right back up, thankfully. And then they were, uh, we threw a throw bag and reeled them in and got them in and nobody drowned. And I was thankful, but I was terrified. And then another day happens and I do it again. And then finally, the boss pulls me over. The president of the organization says, Ryan, listen, I know you, I trained you. I, I don't know what you fell into level of fear, but it has paralyzed your ability to do your job. If you don't figure this out, I'm pulling you off the river and you're never going to be a river guide for our company again. That scared me. That was a healthy fear. And then he said to me, you need to figure this out. So what happened was the next time that we went down and we started going down on Sidell Suckle, I remember that we were going there 
And I stopped and I had them get out and I said, go ahead and get out and you stay here. I'm going to go down with my team and we're going to scout out the river and we're going to look at the rapid. And I was with a more experienced guide and I'm sitting there looking at the river and I'm mapping it out on how I'm going to make my turns and what I'm going to do. And I'm proactively studying this thing. And then here's what happens. I go back and I tell the team, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go down there. I'm going to call forward stroke two. Then I'm going to call left turn. Then I'm going to call a right turn. And then we're going to punch through the hole and we're going to be good. And sure enough, that's what we did. And I will believe, I still had a healthy fear of that river. But see, fear, what it did was I let it come into my life and I let it coach me to be proactive. But so many times what happens with fear is people experience fear, rightfully so. And instead of being proactive, they get paralyzed and they do nothing. And that's the kind of fear that the devil wants in your life. The devil wants you to be paralyzed. Do nothing. Shut up. Be quiet. Sit down. Lay down. Be dead. Do nothing. And what God says is, no, I gave you life. You stand up. You speak up. You, you shout out. You do something. And, and so when it comes to this barrier, this barrier of fear, it's an unhealthy fear that I see that's going on in our culture and in our Christianity today that we're afraid to say something about Jesus. We're afraid to be a part of a church at some level. We're afraid to serve. We're afraid that we won't make a difference. Man, there's places and spaces for everybody, especially at our church in this day and time. We're a digital, on-site, online hybrid and you can find a space to serve and make a significant difference. What was going on with the folks back in Jerusalem, back some thousands of years ago in the book of Haggai? They were afraid. They were afraid that when they would return, that another warring nation would come in and just all their efforts would be in vain. In other words, they make the pilgrimage, they go back, they start working on the temple, and all of a sudden, blah, 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 here comes another crazy warring nation, and they just take them rip them out, take them back to Persia now at this point, and make them back again as slaves. They were afraid, rightfully so. But you know what was the problem with their fear? Instead of working on the house of God, they decided to work on something safe, their own houses. So don't fall into that roadblock, that barrier. There is a, 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 an importance for fear, a fear for COVID-19, a fear for uh, the economy and all that. And that's normal and that's right. But d be proactive. Don't be paralyzed. So how do we move forward? Uh, three, three things. Number one, to break through the roadblocks uh, uh, to serve God to, for a life of significance, you just need to accelerate. You need to put some uh, pressure on the gas pedal it's like my son, when, he, when he, we get in the car and we, get the, and, and we got to move from the stop sign to on the, the, the parkway, North Valley Parkway, you got to accelerate. It's time to go. There's a flow of traffic. It's time to do something. Or when you get on the highway or getting a little four banger and you're going up to Flagstaff, you got to punch it. You better accelerate. As a believer, if you're going to break through this, uh, this stagnant pool, perhaps, of lackadaisicalness when it comes to serving God. It's time to get up out of the pew. It's time to get off, off the couch and do something. And you're like, I can't. I got underlying health issues or I'm not comfortable with COVID-19. Okay, fine. Find a place to serve somewhere online, remotely. We've got spots for you. But it's time to accelerate. Accelerate means move quickly. And see, that's exactly what happens in the book of Haggai. These folks finally get it because they're good, godly people. We ought to be like those folks in the book of Haggai who are going through our own difficult time, but decide, you know what, I'm going to do something. Here's what the message paraphrases in Haggai chapter 1, verse 12. Once Haggai speaks up and says, you need to do something. Quit working on your house, work on God's house. So look what it says. All the people with them listened. Ha ha, they listened, really listened to the voice of their God. When God sent the prophet Haggai to them, they paid what? Attention. To him, in listening to Haggai, they honored God. And that honoring God was work. They need, we need to serve. Ladies and gentlemen, our example in life is Jesus Christ. And 
The gospel tells us that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He's king and he comes serving. You and me, ladies and gentlemen, as believers, we're servants. And we serve our great king in heaven. And our great king in heaven at a time like this, 2020, says, will my church serve? Will they be active in a difficult time? I need them now more than ever. And this is our generation. This is our spot. We need to accelerate. We need to move towards service pretty quickly. Number two, let's break that roadblock and remember. Remember what, you say? Remember who's with you. God is with you. He, he's right there with you. I, I remember maybe, maybe when you walked in today, you saw that big cross, that big steel beam that, that stands out in the courtyard. You know what that is? That's the 9-11 cross. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an exact replica of it. You know what's significant about that? When those, when those uh, planes came crashing into the World Trade Center, all the buildings came crashing down, all the rubble. And Do you know what emerged out of that rubble? A cross. And it quickly became the symbol of faith, hope, and love for all the first responders in New York City and actually became a symbol of hope for the entire nation. You know what the message was? That God is with you right in the midst of your tragedy. <laughs> that, that when the whole world comes crashing down, God's there. And so you need to break a roadblock and that roadblock it needs to be broken with the remembering that God is with you, man. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Three different times. That's what the voice of the Lord said to those people back when they're, they're trying to reopen their place of worship. Be strong. God is with you. Just like he was with Joshua, when Joshua was taking up the mantle of leadership for Moses and the voice of the Lord spoke to Joshua and said, be strong, I'll be with you. Or, 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 or with, uh, when David was telling Solomon the message that, that, that David told Solomon to build that temple in the first place was, I'm with you. And you need to know God's with you. I, I don't know what kind of setback that you're feeling right now and you're feeling like maybe you can't serve in a significant way, but you need to remember that something pretty important that God is with you. He's Emmanuel. That's what we sing about during Christmas, God with us. Or how about the Great Commission when Jesus said to his disciples, hey, listen, I'm with you to the end of the age. This age that you and I live in is called the church age, and we're awaiting. We got to do our best in this time, in this day, in 2020, with all that it has in the years to come, to remember God's with us. We need to accelerate. We can't step back. We need to move forward as believers. Number three, I want to challenge you to focus. Keep your eyes on the road, not on the rear view. Well, this is a driving lesson right now for, for me and my kids when I'm teaching them to drive and we're, we're getting out there and you kind of want to look in the rear view. You want to check your music. You want to check all these other things. No, keep your eyes on the road. That's the most important thing in driving and moving forward is keep your eyes on the road. Look, look what's ahead of you. And, and that was the message that, that Haggai and, and that God used Haggai to speak to the Jewish folks that were returning back to their not so normal promised land was that they need to keep their eyes on the future, that God had a plan and a purpose for them and their families and their faith. Like he was going to work it out. But so many times we get distracted and we don't focus on the, what's in front of us. And we focus on what's in the behind us or to the side or in the rear view. Back on that uh, illustration as a rafting guide, let me tell you this story. I, I remember I had this one trainer who used to tell me this. He said, Ryan, when you're, when you're, when you're on the river, now you got to remember, a river is going downhill, right? Because water travels downhill. So you're moving downhill. Rivers don't go uphill. So rivers are going downhill. And so as a river guide, I'd stand up in the back of the boat. And I remember the master trainer would tell me, Ryan, keep your eyes down river. You always have to read two to three times of turns in front of you. You have to read the whole thing all at once. And you have to learn how to navigate and how to turn and move and, and do that. And, and the key in rafting is setup. 
before anything happens, you're already set up. Because you already know what's going to happen. You're, you know two or three maneuvers beyond what you're about to do. And he used to have this command. He'd yell out. His name was Michael. Michael would yell out, Rice, hesitation is devastation. And what he meant was every time I would set up on a move, if I, fe- if I hesitated, it was devastation. I would devastate my, my raft and, and my people and the people, the, the things, that, uh, w- w- my, my boat. And the key, I think, to the Christian life is that you, you got you to gotta keep your eyes out front. You got to focus as a believer, not, not on the things in the past, not on the rear view, not rear view Christianity, looking in the back. And like the, the Jewish folks were, the returnees, they were looking back to the days of past and all the glory that was there once upon a time. But you've got to focus on what's in front of you. And we need to finish out this year strong, ladies and gentlemen. And there's two easy ways I want to encourage you to do that. Number one is to serve. Text NVSERVE to 94090. We've been telling you that for some time now, but find a way to serve. God wants to use your life for a life of significance. We've got a future ahead of us. We're a church that invests in the next generation. We're building a church, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, and the, the community's building around us. And this whole thing that we're going through will pass. But you know what? We can't, we can't do nothing in between now and then. We've got to keep moving forward if North Valley will move forward. And we're about to open up three services uh, one mask required, and the other's recommended but optional. And here's what I'm going to say. We can't do it if you're not a part of it. We need folks to serve. Uh, so you can text uh, NVSERVE to 94090. Let's move forward. Secondly, here's an easier way you can be a part of just helping make a end out an awesome year for North Valley. is just contribute financially. I said that last week. But I I would rather you jump in and serve because I think that's harder than to give. I would almost rather you do that. But I'm going to tell you there's no greater time to give in in 2020 than any other time ever to give financially to our church than now. Our world needs Jesus. needs the church moving forward. Let's end the year strong. Contribute together and make a big difference for God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. As the worship team comes up, Matt and the team, Lord, I pray that you would speak to people about them moving forward and moving forward with North Valley for your glory and for our good. We pray that we would take bold steps to live a life of significant service, surrender to Jesus Christ for your glory. Amen.